Good morning and welcome to this service of worship at Bower Hill Church. Please join in the call to worship which is in your bulletin. Maintain justice and do what is right. God, our Savior, is coming soon. What shall we return to the Lord for all the good things God has done for us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Mighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent the spirit of your Son into our hearts. Grant us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that all people may know the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We are a people born of water and the Spirit. We have made promises to be Christ's faithful disciples and to show his love until our life's end. Although we fail to fulfill those baptismal vows, God's faithful love endures forever. Confident of God's grace, let us confess our sin and the sin of the world. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your your great great compassion, compassion, cleanse cleanse us from from all sin. sin. Do Do not not cast us away from from your presence, or take take your Holy Spirit Spirit from us. us. Restore Restore to us us the joy of your salvation, salvation, and sustain sustain us with your your bountiful bountiful spirit. spirit. Hope does not disappoint us, for God's love has been poured into our hearts. 
Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 15 and verses 21 through 28. Listen to what the Spirit might say to you in this reading, this perhaps troubling reading from the gospel of Matthew. 
Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join with me now in the responsive reading of Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained the blessing, life forevermore. And finally, our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures is found in Genesis. You know, we've been kind of doing a whirlwind tour through the lives of the matriarchs and the patriarchs this summer. And so much has happened in Joseph's life since last week when we saw him sold by his brothers into slavery. He worked as a common slave in a household, and he worked his way up to become, after a stint in prison, the second-hand man in Pharaoh's cabinet in Egypt. And now that there is a famine in the whole region, the very same brothers who sold him into slavery come looking to him for help, not knowing that he is their brother. All they see before them is an Egyptian official. And this is the story of how he reveals himself to them after all these years and after their guilt of having sold him into slavery. And so listen to the word of the Lord as it comes to us from Genesis 45, verses 1 through 5, and verses 10 through 15. Joseph has been talking to his brothers, and they do not recognize him. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must go and tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. May God bless to our understanding this reading from God's holy word, and to God's name be glory and praise. Amen. 
Well, last week we did see how Joseph, Joseph's brothers were debating whether they should kill him or sell him into slavery, and in the end, they just can't resist the urge to turn a tidy profit on their brother, and so they sell him. They sell him to some merchants who are traveling through. Today, we find Joseph decades later, again in the presence of those same brothers, but now the shoe is on the other foot. Now Joseph has all the power and the brothers come begging. He's capable of avenging himself at last, but instead he offers them pardon. Have you found forgiveness to be quite that simple in your life? Is forgiveness that easy? No, of course not. We're, we're missing long decades probably of brooding, years of Joseph's grief and anguish, anger that Joseph had to endure, maybe even nurture, before he was able to come to this place of forgiveness. We have not seen in our whirlwind tour of Joseph's life all the suffering that brought him to this place where he's ready to forgive. Because forgiveness does take time. Forgiveness is made up in part of forgetfulness, which distances us from our suffering and helps us to find meaning in it that we could not see before. When we forget old meanings, new ones can emerge. Forgetting, it it purifies life and gives us the strength to move forward into the future. Think how quickly we forget some things. What did you dream about last night? Do you remember? What was your first thought when you woke up, not yesterday, but the day before yesterday? You don't remember. Did you ever find your other sock? You probably don't remember. Forgetfulness, it it comes and sweeps away the great bulk of the things that we, we say and do and think from day to day. Forgetfulness claims all but the most noteworthy things. And even those things, it changes over time. You know, I I got home from Cameroon, Africa exactly 20 years ago last month. During my five years in Cameroon, I found the evenings very hard to fill. Once I was done with my lesson plans for the next day and grading papers and that kind of thing, there was little to do in the evenings except to read a book. And even that got kind of tiresome sometimes. Those long purple nights descended like a like a stage curtain, all at once. And then the raucous chorus of the insects would start in and they would crank up the band and it would play until sunrise. But after night fell, there would be 12 hours of darkness for on the equator, nighttime lasts 12 hours and daytime lasts 12 hours all year round. The sun goes down at 6.30, it comes up at 6.30. Of course, I didn't want to sleep for 12 hours, but there was no internet to entertain us the way there is today. No TV, no going to the gym, which would have been my first choice. (laughs) No going out to restaurants. You could listen to the radio. There was one national radio station, but it mostly played Cameroonian pop music, of which I was not a fan music which invariably featured a coach's whistle as an instrument. I suppose I could have had people from home send me jigsaw puzzles, but I did find one meaningful way to spend my evenings in that place. I wrote. I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. My best writing, my most heartfelt writing, was put into letters that I sent to a girl that I later tried to marry when I got home from Africa. But that relationship ended under unfortunate circumstances, and I'm sure that those letters have long since met a similar fate. My less inspired and less witty and less creative writing went into a daily journal. Most evenings I would find myself recording the daily goings-on of that day in the pages of a book. And those journals, I've I've carried them around with me for 20 years, and I have never once cracked one open. For 20 years, I have not so much as glanced 
at anything I wrote over there. I took them with me when I went to live in New York, brought them back here to go to seminary. We took them with us when we moved up to Cain, never opened them, opened them, brought them back down here with us where they have been sitting in the attic of our house for 10 years, untouched, until nine days ago. Nine days ago, I decided that it was at last time for me to start writing down some of my Africa stories so that they're not completely lost. And so I thought it would be good to look at the journals and compare memory to what I wrote at the time. I waited until the evening when all the bats were out of the attic and it was safe to go up there. I ventured up to the attic and I fetched down those old journals and I took a few days of study leave during the week, went to a quiet place that I know, and there for the first time ever, I cracked open the Africa journals. I was nervous. I really was. Why did I never do it over the course of 20 years? Why did it take two decades? I think I thought it would be an emotional experience. I think I, I partly feared looking into the eyes of the young man I would find in those pages. You will find this hard to believe, but the person who wrote those journals had a tendency to be just a little bit full of himself. <laughs> and so many of my philosophies of life have changed since those days. I don't know that I would have it in me to go back under the same circumstances. I don't know that I would want to go back. Not to mention my understanding of mission has changed. And my beliefs about God have changed. My beliefs about cultural imperialism have changed. I just, I just have a lot of reasons not to want to look at the person who lives on in the handwritten pages of those journals. But look, I did. And despite the occasional moments of eye rolling at my young self, with all of his immaturity and pomp, it hasn't been that bad. It has not been an emotional experience at all. I read in that crazy slanted handwriting for pages and pages and I think, this is kind of dull. This is kind of boring. But then out of nowhere, I'll find a perfect gem. Then out of nowhere, I'll find something that I completely forgot that I never wanted to forget. A person, an event, a day in the life, a description of Cameroon or its ways. And I'll think to myself, what a treasure I have here. What a treasure to possess this record of those times, those people, those lives. And as I read, I marveled at all the things I've forgotten as the years have trickled by. In a school of 900 students, I used to pride myself on knowing a lot of their names. Now. Most of the names are gone. All but a few of the names are gone. In fact, the journal keeps making reference to somebody named Joseph. Joseph this, Joseph that, Joseph came to visit. Apparently this was a person who used to visit me all the time. He's always showing up at my door in the journal. I have no memory of Joseph. I can't remember his face. I can't remember his voice. I can't remember a word he ever said, not a single anecdote. Nothing to convince me that he was anything other than my Cameroonian imaginary friend. Most, purple, most people named in the journals, of course, I do recall, even if I have not thought about them for a long time. But there are little details that I had forgotten, like how everybody told me to fire the woman who cooked for me when her uncle, the school principal, was caught embezzling and fired. Apparently, the uncle believed that I had some hand in getting him fired, and everybody came to me and said, she's going to poison you for revenge. I didn't think it would be ethical to fire a woman for being the niece of a scoundrel. None of us would have jobs. And my refusal to fire her made her, I think, my strongest friend and ally in that place. I'd forgotten why I was even sent to that school way, way out in the bush when the original plan was to send me to one in the city. The Cameroonians had misread the paperwork sent from the church in Louisville, 
and they thought that I belonged to some partnership between some Presbyterians in Mississippi and some Presbyterians way, way out in the bush called St. Andrew's Partnership, when indeed, or in fact, I belonged to a St. Andrew's church. They just read it all wrong. And so by a silly misunderstanding, I was spared the woes of life in a dangerous, dense African city and instead afforded the delights of life out among the rainforests and the banana plantations of rural Cameroon. And each time an old and perhaps not very significant memory like that restored to me, was restored to me by reading those journals, I had to ask, how did I forget that? I thought I would just never forget that. It was so important at the time. How did I forget that person? How did I forget that situation? How did I forget that place, that event? And very often, perhaps you can attest to this too, I found that my memories were all wrong. I looked at the things that I wrote when the event occurred, and it was nothing like the way I remembered it. Two very different stories. How could the years have changed the narrative in my mind? Whereas I once saw my African story as more or less the tale of a failed missionary, the years have taught me to see it with new meaning as a story of growth, a story of my journey toward this place. The years have helped me to change the meaning, to see my own story in a new way. But human memory is like that. It is pragmatic. It is self-serving. It is self-preserving. It only keeps those things that it believes we need. It disposes of the rest, or else it gently transforms the past episodes from what they really were to something more palatable for us to live with today. One by one, our moments, our days, stream into forgetfulness, and they are lost except to the mind of God. It can feel like a great sadness, but that forgetfulness too might be a blessing. It might be the heart's way of reteaching us our own stories with new meanings, just as Joseph apparently did over the course of years. That's Joseph, not Joseph, the guy that I have completely forgotten in Cameroon. This is Joseph, the character in our Bible reading. He has had decades to stew over the events of that fateful day so long ago when his brothers fell on him and tore off his precious coat of many colors, a gift from their father, and they sold him into slavery. For years, Joseph was left to seethe in his rage, brooding darkly on revenge. He used to dream of a day when those brothers would fall into his clutches and he would make them pay for every last humiliation. Revenge was the dream that kept him going. As he languished in an Egyptian prison for a crime he did not commit, revenge gave him a purpose in life. As negative emotions sometimes do, give us purpose. His anger was the smooth, heavy stone that held his heart. And he nurtured it there. He rubbed it smooth from caressing it so long and so often. But now in recent years, tiny cracks had begun to form on the surface of that smooth, smooth marble. The story used to be very simple. His brothers were jealous rat finks who sold him into slavery because they hated him. That was the story. But time and distance and maturity had given him a broader perspective on the events leading up to his brother's great hatred for him and their betrayal. Now he knows that his brothers hated him because their father loved him clearly and openly much more than them. He knew it at the time, but instead of being humble, he flaunted it. He bragged. He used to tell them that he had dreams wherein they were all bowing down to him. 
He strutted around in that ridiculous coat. He was young. He was immature, yes. But in his heart, after all these years, he knows that he maybe bore a little bit of the blame for their hatred. He inflamed it. He drove them to a state of pure loathing. The story is no longer simple for Joseph. Now he's able to find new meaning in the same old story. He believes that God brought him into Egypt in order to save the very family that rejected him from famine. Forgiveness happens after we stop telling ourselves all the same old additions and versions of the story and instead find new meaning in old events. This is the beauty of forgetting. (laughs) For without some small degree of forgetfulness, we might never find the freedom to forgive. It clears away the debris and allows new life to occur. Forgetfulness is in the nature, it's in the skies, it's in the water, it's in the air, the trees. The gift of forgetting is how we move forward into the future with hope and with joy. If we forget too much, we lose lose ourselves. But if done in the natural way, forgetfulness can be like a river that drains the rich, fertile plains of our souls, healing, renewing, giving new life. I think I've told you this story before. I did something mean to an acquaintance back in college. I found a dead snake. This was Oklahoma. There were snakes everywhere. I found a dead snake, and I coiled it up on his desk in his dorm room with its face kind of facing toward the door so that when he walked in, he would see this snake on his desk as if it was going to launch itself at him. The guy came home. It scared him out of his wits. He threw his hairbrush at it. I mean, this was the late 80s, but the fact that he had a hairbrush maybe had something to do with my choosing him as a victim? I don't know. Come on, I wasn't always a minister. What 18-year-old can pass up the bullying potential of a dead snake? But that snake became a legend on campus. Everyone knew what I had done with the snake. Some classmates, when I come into touch with them again, into contact, they will remind me about it. Some thought I was a real jerk for doing it, and others thought it was funny. The ones who thought I was a jerk are right. When my victim friended me on Facebook many years later, I sent him a private message and said, listen, man, I'm really sorry about the snake. That was dumb. I was immature. And he said, snake? What snake? There was no snake. He had no recollection of the event. It happened. Everybody remembers it but him. His memory, his memory did not find the event helpful to his self-image or his own happiness. And so he discarded it. He put it away. There are many kinds of forgetting. There is that self-protective kind. But then there are the everyday forgettings, too. The forgetting of things that seem to matter only in the moment. Passwords, appointments, telephone numbers, a pan on the stove. It's always fun to tell pastors, hey, I've been thinking about what you said in your sermon last week, and then watch their eyes closely as they scramble to remember what they said last week. (laughs) There's the normal everyday forgettings of daily things, and that's healthy, for it saves our brains from overload. But there's also the forgetting of those things that would just be too cumbersome too burdensome, too painful perhaps to remember. The debt of gratitude that we might owe to somebody, it might weigh on us too heavily unless we swept it aside. The guilt that some of us know might crush us unless we just forgot it. The sorrows that some of us have known might incapacitate us. And so we forget. The human mind strives for clarity And forgetfulness is one of its healthy tactics. 
It can hurt to forget, of course. But forgetfulness, too, can be the sweet daily gift that keeps life moving into the future, moving forward. Look what Joseph does. When confronted with the people who ruined his life, but not really, (laughs) the people who sold him into slavery, he says this, essentially, I hate what you did to me, and for many years I hated you, and yet I like the results. I like the person I am today, and I would not be that person if not for the things that you did for me. And so time gives us a wisdom to re-see our own stories in their rich complexity. The forgetfulness of time allowed Joseph to see past his pain to the bigger picture of his life and how it fits into the greater scheme of the world. Because he suffered, he's now able to rescue his family and the father he loves from a famine and to save God's promise to Abraham, his great-great-grandfather even. Or his great-grandfather. I should know that. After time had dulled his initial pain and anger, Joseph was free to assign new meaning to the events of his life. It was no longer a simple tragic story of how his hateful brothers had tried to kill him because they were rat finks, and they ended up selling him into slavery and separating him from the father who adored him. No, now it was a story of redemption and rescue and renewal. Sometimes tragedies become comedies. After a very, very long time, sometimes it it takes a long time, but they do. It takes the gentle process of forgetfulness, which removes us from the pain and the anger, which gives us at last the freedom to see a bigger picture and assign new meaning to old events. And so... What does that mean for us? Several things. If you are struggling to forgive someone, be patient. Very often people say, I forgive you too prematurely, for it can take decades. Instead of saying, I forgive you to someone you cannot yet forgive, try saying, I've decided to begin the process of forgiving you. (laughs) Hallmark does not sell greeting cards to that effect, but it's usually a truer sentiment. And once you have made the determination to forgive, preheat the oven for a decade, maybe two, and allow the hand of time to visit you with the slow gift of forgetfulness, making your pain more and more distant and giving you a broader perspective on your own story, your own life. And when the moment is right, allow new meanings to emerge from the same old stories the same old you. Or, if you are waiting to be forgiven, take heart, as we said last week, take heart. It may yet happen. It is really my very sincere prayer that this process of healing can take place not just in your soul, but among the peoples of our world, among Israelis and Palestinians, among black Americans and white Americans among Muslims and Christians, among conservatives and liberals. It is time in the life of our world, and perhaps in your life as an individual, to assign new meanings to some of our past stories, things that keep us stuck in cycles of anger, bitterness, brokenness, fear. Very often, the people against whom we hold grudges aren't even there anymore. They're so old and full of regrets that they're not the same person or else they're changed or else they're dead. Can we say with Joseph, I don't like what happened to me, but I am who I am today because of it, and I love who I am. Can we do that? As the years pass and our perspectives grow milder, let us look for new meaning in old events. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. Almighty God around us and within us, we pray for those who are locked in circumstances beyond their control, restrained by oppressors and seeing no end to their captivity. May they discover hope buried in deepest suffering through Jesus Christ, who shared the weakness and the despair of human life and yet gave even death a new outcome and brought resurrection from a closed tomb. O oh God, we pray for the church set in the world to show how people belong together and how your gifts are given to be shared. Grant that as we feel for the rejection and the voicelessness of others, we may meet Christ in them and bear witness to Christ's transformative love. We pray for the communities in which we live and work, for people under stress, tired of pandemic, worried about finances, worried about health, worried about everything, and unable to deal with their difficulties. For those who seek comfort in ways which bring no help, for all who are fearful, Give us grace to show by our concern and actions how each is loved and valued by you. We remember those now hidden from us, but at home with you. We give thanks especially for those who have strengthened our weak faith, built up our trusts in you, and by their lives have drawn us into the life of Christ. We name in prayer those who are upon our hearts. We pray for Jeff Carper. Dennis Geis, Nancy Geis, Mary Gorski, Jim McAnulty, Joanne McAnulty, Nina Helbling, Jim Burke. We pray for Andrew Astorita, Jeff Conte, Tommy DeSantis, Neil Harrison, Melody Cronwald. Brian McFeely, Rick Miller, Luann Pattison, Virginia Reinstatler. We pray for those many, many who were affected by the explosion in Beirut. Look with mercy, O God, upon the world that you have created. Dry tears and alleviate suffering. And we ask you to hear us, even as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give us Give this day our daily bread, bread and, forgive and forgive us our debts, debts as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And, and lead us not into temptation, into temptation but deliver us from, from evil. evil. For thine, For thine is, is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and, and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Oh, 
We are so glad to be part of your weekly rituals, hopefully your Sunday rituals, but watch us whenever you can. We're so glad that worship continues even in this time as we do look forward to a day when we can gather again by some means or another in this place. Until that time, reach out to each other, call each other, let us know what's going on in your life, and receive the benediction. Go into the world knowing compassion and seeking justice. Give voice to the silent. Give strength to the weak. See one another. Hear one another. Love one another. It is as simple as that, and indeed very hard. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you from this time forth and forevermore. Amen.